Fatima. So once again, a warm welcome to all of you um, to our last but one session of the lecture series, The Critical Gaze, Reflections on Global Crisis in Portuguese Language Comics uh, here at the University of Cologne. I'm Yannick Scholz, a research assistant at the Portuguese Brazilian Institute of the University of Cologne. And I'm happy to welcome today's guest, James Scorer. And actually, we are widening the view. We are zooming out a bit from Brazil and looking on Latin America today, on the Spanish-speaking Latin America. And we are happy and proud to have James with us as an expert on that topic, uh, on Latin American Spanish-speaking comics. And I would like to introduce you uh, to James Scorer and his work. He is a senior lecturer in Latin American Cultural Studies in the Department of Spanish, Portuguese and Latin American Studies at the University of Manchester in Great Britain. And he's currently the chair of the Language as Undergraduate Program Committee. And between 2014 and 2019, he was co-director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. His research focuses on Latin American urban imaginaries, particularly those of Buenos Aires, and on Latin American cultural production, especially photography and comics. Between 2016 and 2019, he was the principal investigator of the International Network's Comics and the Latin American City. And this year, actually, um, he will be the principal investigator from this year on. He will be the principal investigator um, for a three year funded project entitled Comics and Race in Latin America, together with Peter Wade. Uh, James Gore is the author of several books, um, for example, City in Common Culture and Community in Buenos Aires from 2016. And he's editor of Comics Beyond the Page in Latin America from last year, 2020. And he's also the co-editor of Comics and Memory in Latin America and the book Cultures of Anti-Racism in Latin America. Um, yes, these are two, I think, two, two key books, two key publications um, on, on comics, uh, both Comics and Memory and also Comics Beyond the Page. And I do recommend all of you to have a look into those really interesting and, and fantastic books, uh, which give you already an overview over the, the comic situation in Latin America, both in Brazil and in the Spanish speaking world. And today, James will talk about recent comic productions, recent, recent scenes from uh, Argentina, Arg Argentina sorry, uh, Argentina, uh, from Colombia and from Peru. And we're very happy and we're looking forward to your talk, James. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the, for the invite and the introduction. Um, as I've been saying, um, just before we came on air, I'm somewhat of an imposter here, given I'm going to be talking about Spanish language comics production rather than Portuguese language production, but hopefully it will be of some interest in a wider contextual sense. Um, I did also want to just flag up in case there's anybody who is interested, um, the project that starts on the 1st of March, that is a three-year funded project called entitled Comics and Race in Latin America, that as Yannick said, I'm doing with Pete Wade. Um, it, it, there's a description of the project there, but we're also advertising two postdoctoral positions for these posts. If there happens to be anybody who is interested, there's one in cultural studies and there's one in social anthropology. Um, so if anybody happened to be interested or knew anyone was interested, the deadline is actually this Thursday. Um, but if anyone's got any questions at the end, I could also answer questions about that. Okay. Um, can I share my screen, Yannick? All right, there we go. Okay, so um, the uh, sort of title that I gave Yannick was a sort of more descriptive title. Um, and this is sort of 
the real title, if you like, um, before the volcano recent comics magazines from Latin America, although it is true that I will be focusing on Argentina, Colombia and Peru, specifically three publications, and they're actually magazines. I actually didn't have time to also talk about zines as well, though I'll conclude right at the end by saying something very briefly about that. So it's been commonplace to speak of the digital turn in Latin American cultural production during the early years of the new millennium. And that's also true of comics. So obviously the famous example is the groundbreaking Argentine blog, Historietas Reales, often cited as the most significant initial foray into a Latin American digital comics landscape, which was started in 2005, but which ushered in um, a range of different digital platforms, uh, blogs, websites, all of which have made it much easier to produce, disseminate um, and, and promote comics to wide, often very transnational audiences. They've facilitated the growth of comics based networks, author reader interactions and also helped underrepresented groups and particularly women, I would suggest to gain greater exposure in terms of the comics world. All the same. I think it's important not to lose sight of the role played by print publications in this period in terms of the current renaissance in Latin American comics, if we can call it that. There was a value and still is a value, I think, for both artists and readers in terms of the materiality of these kinds of publications, physical sites for the expression of connections and differences that thrive on the desire for shared practices of creativity and varying degrees of formality. So even though the internet's provided alternative means for producing and disseminating comics and creating comics communities, the comics world still in part thrives on the materialities of consumption, the fetishistic desire for the physical completion of print runs and the exchanges that take place between consumers and retailers in specialist bookstores and comic events. So in this presentation, I'm gonna focus on three comics magazines that form part actually of a sort of wider corpus of serial publications that are available in print um, during the period of, um, you know, more or less uh, the first two decades of the 21st century. Um, so I take these magazines or define these magazines obviously as being more formal than fanzines in the sense that they were less deliberately ephemeral, they were more expensive to produce generally, uh, less dependent on processes and the aesthetics of DIY, and also have some formal distribution networks or and or uh, markers such as ISBNs or ISSNs. Um, this table then might form some kind of a, a guide as the sort of wider corpus of magazines, um, though in this presentation I'm only going to focus on three of them, Fierro, La Historieta Argentina, Carboncito, and then a little bit more on Revista Larva. So I want to suggest that these magazines played a fundamental part in laying the foundations for what we might now call a Latin American comics. And I use that term not to suggest that recent Latin American comics share a kind of regional aesthetic or that there's anything approaching a Latin American comics industry, nor that, con that concepts of sort of more localized and I suppose particularly, I mean, national traditions and practices are not in circulation. But I think it's justifiable to use such a term because there's much more of a conscious recognition and fermentation of networks that span the region. The sort of, these magazines then are sort of manifestations of links and affects that do not construct communities if we see communities as sort of closed off entities, but rather sociabilities. They speak to borders, not as limits, but as spaces of encounter that are meant to be traversed and moved beyond. beyond. Um, the publications were situated in and fed off political sympathies that were circulating across the region during this period, but I think they're really networks that exist beyond politics as expressions of democracy and instead celebrate shared forms of expression and patterns of creativity. So in this, I have um, found the work of Emily Apter very helpful. Uh, the politics of these magazines would be, I think, what she calls the finest of fine grain politics. Though glimpses of more direct political expression are present, they are certainly a far cry from presenting any kind of a manifesto, whether that's political or aesthetic. 
Instead, the interventions made by these magazines are often uh, imperceptible, only emerging when taken as a whole, at which point they form in, again, to use Apter's words, a kind of incorrect mix of gestures, material practices, and environmental interactions that form something like an atmosphere. So the notion of a, the existence of a Latin American comics is perhaps best exemplified by this publication from 2017, a groundbreaking collection of comics by artists from over 10 Latin American countries. The title, El Volcán, and the cover painting of a volcano captured the sense of some kind of a tectonic shift in the region's comics production. Not entirely dissimilar, I suppose, to the boom of mid 20th century Latin American prose fiction. But if the boom suggested some kind of big bang without precedent, then the trope of the volcano spoke to the explosion of a long simmering comics magma. That magma has started to fuse the long tradition of national focus with a more regional outlook. So the magazines then to continue with the met metaphor that I talk about here were the sort of substrata to this explosion, a melting pot of ideas, exchanges, disagreements and differences, as well as sites of commonality. Perhaps because of their very veracity and certainly because most if not all were at best just making enough to get by for the next issue. Uh, the notional archive for such publications poses a real challenge for the researcher. The figure of the collector, the hoarder, the obsessive nerd who trapes around comic stores, comic cons or online platforms in search of missing issues, special editions or artist writers signature combinations is pretty well established in the world of comics. But maybe the academic researcher is not so different. The latter also sets out to see everything, to collate sources, to organize them to some kind of completion. The researcher aspires to find the lost document in the archive, the ephemeral missing piece of the jig jigsaw that somehow will tie everything together, throwing new light on what's already seemed complete, but in that very gesture, also making completion incomplete. So in Latin America, of course, the incompleteness of any archive is intensified. Lack of state funding for the infrastructures, management and running of archives threaten the preservation of what already exists and makes the expansion of the archive difficult. And that's particularly the case when it comes to comics, <clears throat> which are rarely at the top of any librarian's shopping list. <clears throat> the fact remains that the most extensive collections of Latin American comics are to be found outside of Latin America. So the Iberoamericanisches Institute in Berlin, the University of Iowa, Michigan State University, University of New Mexico, to name four of the most important ones. And if I've been able to pull, I think, the corpus of materials that I'm going to be studying in the course of the whole book that this would form at one chapter, that's because I've been fortunate enough to have had various kinds of institutional backing to do so. But even in those places, runs of magazines and um, let alone zines okay, are often incomplete. So the researcher, I think, of Latin American comics has to embrace this incompleteness to some degree. So if we argue that the magazines that I'm going to discuss today played an important role in showcasing our Latin American comics, then that should ask us, I think, to ask what kind of Latin America they were fermenting. And if the incompleteness of the archive is anything to go by, then that fits with an outlook of Latin American comics and even a Latin America that is porous, incomplete, and constantly looking beyond its own borders. So uh, just a brief sort of theoretical interlude then, which Latin Americanism. So at the same time as these magazines were being published, albeit entirely coincidentally, Latin American studies was doubling down on some of its own internal fissures and uh, splits and contradictions. So following the acrimonious split between within the subaltern studies group, the field became divided between the post-colonial post-subaltern studies line and the deconstructive infrapolitical and post-hegemonic line. John Beverly was the key figure of the former group uh, who recently stepped back from his espousal of the governments of the so-called pink tide, those left-wing administrations that characterized much of Latin America in the first decade of the new millennium, but he remains tied to the post-colonial underpinning of the subaltern studies group, rejecting what he sees as the overly literary, overly negative 
an overly de delocalizing thrust of, on the one hand, uh, the latter group's deconstructive bent, and on the other, fantasies about the multitude, what he describes as fantasies about the multitude or the post hegemonic. On the other hand, then, is Alberto Moreiras, one of Beverly's key targets, who rejects the call for post subalternism subalternism as a collusion with the post-colonial state in the name of identitarian thought, one that rejects an entire movement of theoretical thought in Latin American studies that from a specific point of time, somewhere in the late 1980s for some, somewhere in the early 90s for others, refused principal identitarian thought in the attempt to seek a critical edge that the Latin Americanist tradition could not and would not offer. So I think there's a lot to be gained from rejecting the notion of idealized local truths, but we shouldn't assume, and Kate Yanks here is I think very important, that we are caught between somehow Beverly's reified understanding of place and the kind of purported placenessness that circulates around Moreiras' infrapolitics. So Yanks counters Beverly's critiques of those um, like Moreiras or Brett Levinson who see, quote, Latin America as an encrucijada, a site of crossings that confounds the structure of identity. As she suggests, such an argument doesn't strip Latin America of place, but takes location as a site that's always already marked by crossing and difference. And she, she adds, translative crossings are inevitably related to an origin of sorts, a specific regional historical site, but that site's only a starting point for considering difference, not a foundation or horizon. And this discussion has echoes of uh, the geographer Doreen Massey's understanding of place as a collection of stories so far, unbounded, incomplete, and constantly subject to crisscrossing trajectories and the palimpsestic accumulation of particular temporalities. As she says, the geography of borderlessness and mobility is countered by the coexistence of the geography of border discipline, such that it's then negotiation, and she emphasizes that word, which brings the question into politics. And that understanding of place, I think, allows for a positioning that's not a limit that creates borders between friends and enemies, but one that exists as an intensity. So this is a sort of an idea of a Latin America that is constantly looking beyond itself, that embraces what it isn't, but which does not ignore the negotiations that are inherent, inherent to place. Um, okay. So let's turn then to some of the publications. So the first publication I'm going to look at is uh, an Argentine publication, Fierro, in part, I think, because it encapsulates the manner in which Latin American comics have long been dominated by concerns with the nation and with national cultural traditions. Um, Latin American comics often have been discussed within um, a, a sort of manifestations of boundedness, difference, local authenticity, and uh, in some cases, national populism. And only more recently, I think, are scholars starting to tease out some of the transnational histories that have been embedded, that are, are embedded and were embedded in the history of Latin American comics. Um, so you might see this publication then uh, as symptomatic of the struggles to piece together the nation in comics. So the second iteration of this magazine, which ran from 2006 to 2017, cemented the notion of an Argentine national tradition precisely as other magazines of the same period were laying this foundation for Latin American comics. I think that's partly down to the fact that Argentina has one of the longest standing comics traditions in the region and is one of the few that can at certain times in its history lay claim to actually having had a comics industry. Um, following the 1976-1983 dictatorship, um, the, the magazine Fierro a Fierro, Historietas para Sobrevivientes, and, and this is the cover of the first issue, uh, which ran for 100 issues between 1984 and 1992, and certainly was preoccupied with coming to terms with national identity and a national comics, in the wake of a dictatorship that had, after all, called itself process of national re reorganization. The second run then, which is uh, to move forward, uh, you know, a, a couple of decades, um, ran for, as I say, I think uh, 125 issues, 
Okay, the magazine had very much the same format as the earlier incarnation. It was sold as a supplement, this time to the newspaper Pagina Doce, or kind of supplement or in, in conjunction with. And that magazine, famous for being a staunch supporter of the administrations of both Nestor Kirchner, who was president between 2003 and 2007, and uh, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, who was the president between 2007 and 2015. And that support, the support of that particular newspaper became even more important after 2009, when Cristina introduced the Ley de Medios, which was an attack on large scale media conglomerates in Argentina, and not least the Grupo Clarín. So to some extent, Fierro runs parallel to the kind of national populism set out by the Kirchner governments and particularly the Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner government. And though the latter would look to cross regional alliances with other left-wing governments in Latin America, at the level of cultural production, the focus remained firmly national. And you can see that in terms of comics. So for example, funding for the Museo del Humor uh, and also the Centro de Historieta y Humor Gráfico, uh, the opening of the comics archive in the Biblioteca Nacional, the wider referencing of Oestergeld's El Eternauta during campaign rallies, uh, and also the viral translate, uh, transformation of Nestor into the Nestor Nauta or Nestor Nauts by the militant Kirchner youth group La Campora, all of which served as, as a reminder of the national government's interest in celebrating domestic popular cultural traditions. Um, the second run of Fierro then contributed to that narrative of a national comics. And simultaneously, I think its own position within that national comics tradition. So the second run was edited by Juan Sasturain, who'd edited the magazine in its previous iteration in the 1980s. But not only that, it was populated by a significant number of artists who contributed to the magazine in the 80s. And Sasturain acknowledged this unapologetically in the first issue when he called the contributors a list of dinosaurs. The new subtitle for the magazine was La Historieta Argentina, uh, something that Sastorain would comment on in the editorial for issue 10 when reflecting on accusations that the magazine was getting too big for its boots by putting La Historieta Argentina on the cover, basically saying that um, they didn't have any competition, so what did it matter anyway? Uh, he'd make a similar point in issue 26, suggesting that Argentines should get big headed about the country's unique comic talent. But in fact, uh, the magazine did in many ways present a skewed depiction of the Argentine comics field if we're taking this somehow as being symptomatic of a national tradition. So to begin with, the magazine was um, uh, dominated by men. The covers uh, of the first 49 issues, these are just happened happened to what I had time to look at, though there are, I haven't actually been through the entire list yet, um, but I bet this is probably the same for everything. But the covers of the first 49 issues were all, with one exception, drawn by men. Alejandro Lunik drew the cover for number 10. All the winners of the Ora Fierro competition were men out of 773 submissions. In, that was issue 16. And when Sasturain does address this particular issue in issue 42 in his editorial, which is entitled Hora de las Chicas, Las Chicas de Ahora, he defends the magazine on the grounds that many of its stories have interesting female protagonists, and he doesn't really pick up on the irony that all of these are drawn by men, not least in an issue that only has one contributor who is a woman, a co-author of one script. And it was only in the supplements, uh, particularly the Things like the Picado Fino, published with issue 33, which was edited by Caro Chinaki, that women could gain some kind of a foothold within this publication. Um, it was not just, oh, and this is an example of the kinds of comics that you can see, with, with a, a certain degree of regularity, I would suggest, in Fierro of this second era. So you can make of that what you will. Um, but it wasn't only just sort of misleading, I suppose, in terms of how it presented women within the field. It also elided the manner in which so many Argentine artists during this period were participating in fervent networks of transnational exchanges. Fierro seems interested in reinforcing its own mythic uh, position within a particular national tradition that it seems to imply never entirely died out. 
and almost all the contributors to the second run of Fierro are Argentine. So sometimes, again, in the supplements like this particular Picado Fino would include Latin Americans. Um, this one was edited by the Argentine Angel Mojito, uh, but was explicitly focused on Latin American artists. Um, but in that issue, Safdurain summed up the position on foreign contributors as far as the magazine was concerned, uh, simply noting that um, one of the drawers of the um, uh, of one comic was Uruguayan. Oops. So there were efforts in Argentina to look beyond. Oh, sorry, put carboncito here, but I am going to talk about that. But and it was a brief mention of this one. Okay, there were efforts in Argentina to look beyond the national focus of magazines like Fierro, La Historia de Argentina. So two publications edited by Thomas Dassens, a Frenchman living in Buenos Aires since 1999, both tried to explore a comics world that looked beyond Argentina. The Revista Exabrupto, which only lasted for three issues between 2003 and 2007, and this uh, publication, Sud America, five issues between 2005 and 2007, were examples of this kind of early stages of a transnational outlook that was creeping into Latin American comics during this period. Um, I like the name in particular of this publication, uh, which had a multinational editorial board, included contributions from different authors, and played, I think, on a displaced regional um, identity. And, and this um, title, a sort of phonetic rendition, splitting up a single word into, into, into or two into three fragments, not unlike an act of comic stripping. So it celebrated a kind of sonic playfulness with an exclamation mark, uh, and the inclusion of the car, maybe even a nod to the Kirchner era, recurring throughout the publication, reflects the disruptive nature of the outlook, a crossing that is a meeting point that does not follow and X marks the spot, but rather symbolizes a divergent bifurcation. But maybe the most sustained shift towards the Latin American comics, and certainly one of the earliest can be found in publications in, um, like this one, Carboncito, which was had uh, published over 20 issues between 2001 and 2016. It was produced by the Peruvian brothers Amadeo and Renzo Gonzalez, and it set out to foment initially at least a Peruvian comic scene. So early editorials made the, the publication's position very clear. In issue six was from 2004, the magazine stated that its aim was to promote local comics, hoping that readers would enjoy the works of national artists. Early issues also came with an explicit statement on the back cover that said, this is an independent publication whose objective is to disseminate and promote national comics. But from issue eight onwards, um, the statement on the back cover started to change. It now read, this is an independent publication whose objective is to disseminate and promote comics. So the word national disappeared. And this issue published in 2005 was the first to include a comic by a non-Peruvian contributor, in this case, the Colombian Trucha Frita, who in interview developed one of the earliest statements that recognized the regional shape that the comics field would start to develop over the next decade and a half. Uh, I won't read it out, but in essence, what he says is that um, he thinks that Latin America has a lot of sort of common traits. Uh, and when the, you see um, comics by authors from different countries, you can find many sort of points of commonality uh, and it puts an emphasis on some of the kind of uh, thematic and stylistic qualities that he thinks uh, you can see in this kind of Latin American comics. And his comments highlight two things I think that would come to characterize the magazines analyzed in this, in this uh, talk and by extension perhaps the field of Latin American comics in the new millennium. First of all, the rejection of efforts to try and reproduce US traditions in Latin America. So certainly in this more sort of independent world, independent comics publications, um, uh, the, a lot of them would often reject the idea that you needed to kind of create somehow Latin American superheroes, for example, or um, Latin American versions of manga. I mean, I know those fields are sort of huge in their own way, but within this sort of independent um, landscape, those are two things that are def definite no-nos. Uh, and the second, the kind of call to engage with everyday life, but going beyond the kind of politics of a tercer mundismo, 
Okay, so the idea that that these comics are exploring everyday life, particularly urban everyday life, but not necessarily constantly focusing on you know poverty and uh, and other um, social problems. In 2016, Vicente Plaza wrote that Carboncitos magazines were characterized by what he describes as la vida normal y anormal, la vida urgente, desesperada o tranquila y contempl uh, contemplativa, and by partic in particular focus on the challenges of urban life. And this, he says, um, suggests that or justifies the idea of there being a contemporary Latin American comics. So I'd certainly agree with him that there is an existence of a Latin American comics and that this period is crucial towards, in terms of that shift. Um, and certainly a lot of these comics do focus on everyday life, but I would also suggest that the existence or the possibility of using this term, as I said earlier on, is as much to do with networks of exchange as any particular thematic or aesthetic focus. Um, in a, in a brief correspondence that I had with Renzo Gonzalez, he stated that Carboncito is considered Latin America, a Latin American due to its invitees. But for us, it's a way of familiarizing Peruvian readers with contemporary authors, since in the press, we always see the classic references. <clears throat> but by the time of its later publications, later issues, I should say. Um, Carboncito was manifesting co um, cultural exchanges across Latin America with an extremely diverse list of collaborators, principally from Argentina and Colombia, but also from Spain, Bolivia, Cuba, the US, Venezuela, Brazil, Chile, Costa Rica, Mexico, um, making up about half of all contributors in the final three issues of the magazine. And the editorial to the final issue number 20 um, referenced both the magazine's contribution to a national comic scene they said, we hope that with comics, we've encouraged and contributed to graphic arts in Peru, but also the affective ties that had come to shape the publication in terms of a more regional sense. So they wrote, the emotions of getting to know artists in person at international festivals, those embraces. So I think that's rather symptomatic of that uh, transnational network. Um, and now for the final section, I'll say a little bit more about this um, publication, Revista Larva, which was published in the, originally published in the Colombian city of Armenia. The first issue was published in October 2006 and played on notions of marginality, which was, I think, an apt trope for a comic publication that was located in a city with a population of under 300,000 people, located at the heart, if you like, of the triangle formed by Cali, Medellin and Bogotá but which was simultaneously frequently perceived to be very provincial, sometimes even backward in cultural terms. It was originally only 15 pages and just had a, two stories, the first issue, uh, and it played on a sort of semi-fanzine status with only a, a suggested price stamped on the cover, even if at the same time it carried the symbol of the Universidad de Quindío, where the creators were students. Um, as time went on, the fanzine, which initially had encouraged um, piracy and included jokes about how they were encouraging everybody to sort of photocopy uh, the publication to sort of spread it around as much as possible, then gradually became more formalized. Um, issue six was the first one to include a warning about illegal reproduction. Um, and this sort of went in tune with the increased print run of the publication, which was at that time around sort of 500 to 1000 per issue. And also the fact that now it cost money justified as being necessary within, quote, the stormy seas of independent publications. So the early issues were funded and you can see the covers from some of those at the top were funded by the Universidad de Quindío. Um, they agreed to print them as long as they were distributed for free. And that also explains the green coloring that you can see here, because that was the official color of the university and that was what was left over in the print room. So they didn't mind using that particular color. Um, the next issues five to nine were either self-funded or part funded by the Dirección de Cultura de la Gobernación del Quindío. And the last issues 10 to 17 were supported by a range of different regional and national entities including the Dirección de Cultura de la Gobernación del Quindío, the Fundación Yo Soy Quindío, 
uh, the Ministerio de Cultura de Colombia, uh, and the Plan Nacional de Lectura y Escritura entitled Leer es mi cuento, and also the Alcaldía de Medellín. So you can see there's a sort of a, a, a range of different funding sources for this publication. And that highlights, I think, the precarious nature of producing a magazine of this kind. So again, one that only made money sufficient for a subsequent issue, which was not paying its contributors. This publication was not presenting itself as a seismic shift in the world of comics, but rather offering something that can make a small difference to Colombian comics. We're not inventing anything new, they said, but we do believe we can offer something a little different, at least for this corner of the world, referring to Colombia as this unknown dimension. Um, this difference was in part revamping what they saw as the prevailing tropes of the comic scene in Colombia. We don't want to show you any more rehashed heroes, an ongoing and interminable story about a samurai Simon Bolivar. For all the changes that the magazine went through, the desire to revamp Colombian comics would remain a constant. Um, the editorial in issue six said it was very difficult creating comics in Colombia, partly because country, uh, Colombia, quote, is a country addicted to easy jokes, which pursues superficiality. And as a result, everybody seeks out political feminist or machista or whatever caricatures that appear in newspapers and magazines. We're a country trapped in instantaneous thought, they wrote. Um, and for that reason, when the editorial in issue seven reflected on the discovery of another comics magazine in Mexico called Ladova, the worry was less about competing with a publication of the same name, but that the readers might confuse these two magazines that had a very different take on comics. Uh, basically uh, saying that, you know, that the Mexican Ladova was only interested in manga and, you know, they, that they would be terribly insulted if anyone thought that that was what they were doing. Um, the magazine's blog also made a swipe at the Feria Internacional del Libro de Bogotá and the inclusion at that event of a presentation of work by a team of comic artists calling themselves Dream Tales. Lara attacked the group, quote, which claims to be interested in developing comics in Colombia for their ties to the superhero genre, which the magazine claimed is a far cry from a display of creative authenticity and without um, and even further from seeking out, as they say, on their page, innovation. Uh, and uh, as a sort of, I think, symptomatic of the approach of the magazine, in issue eight, they took a swipe at the font Comic Sans, and they wrote, from the pages of this magazine, we're calling for a boycott on Comic Sans. Don't use it, and if you give in, seek out medical treatment. Please visit www.bancomicsans.com. Um, Certainly, the, so the magazine had a, a serious aim in terms of trying to provide a space for new kinds of um, comics in Colombia. Um, issue eight noted the growth in the number of public libraries that were increasing their comics holding. Um, and in that sense, uh, the magazine did include explicit reflections about the comic scene in Colombia. Included discussions of Colombian works, including pieces by Ino Waters and his fans in Colombian trash. The publication Robot uh, uh, in, uh, and the work of uh, Trucha Frita, and also reviews of Johnny B's book Parque del Poblado. Um, the issue for the, uh, the editorial for the issue number 14 also positioned the magazine within a Colombian tradition by noting that the famous magazine Acme closed after 13 issues. Uh, and uh, also in the subsequent issue, number 15, the magazine noted that. Never before had a national um, comics publication had so much um, impact. As the magazine also pointed out, its growth was not taking place in isolation, but as part of a wider rejuvenation of Colombian comics, not least because the magazine was now working in conjunction with the Entre Viñetas Festival, one of Latin America's most important comics platforms. No doubt that, said, that success fed into the magazine's attack on Colombia's Le de Libro, um, which was uh, which formed a significant part of issue 16. And um, here they critique, critique the law, which basically put comics alongside pornographic magazines as publications of no cultural value and therefore were subject to tax. Um, and in fact, that law would change the following year. But Larava wasn't just a, a, a sort of a magazine that was focused on Colombian comics. In fact, 
when it asked itself why edit comics in Colombia, the answer was to get to other places. So it was a response that was not just that showed it wasn't just about Colombians creating different kinds of comics, but also about engaging with different traditions and places. And the magazine often engaged with a wider comic scene, including epigraphs from key global uh, comics figures, Scott McCloud, Will Eisner, Hergé, book reviews of works by Robert Crumb, Rupert Mulo, um, David Masuchelli, and other pieces that would link the magazine to an underground independent tradition in the US, including the translation of an article by Peter Bagg expressing his delight for superhero comics, uh, a piece by Skip Williamson about the underground comic scene of the 60s, and um, an insert focused on Harvey Pekar. Um, there was certainly no suggestion that the comic scene in Colombia could be compared to that of the US. Through Chafrita's short comic on drawing comics in Colombia, Riley observed that whereas Chris Ware could survive off Beneficencia in Colombia, drawing comics was indigencia. And in issue 13, an article by Pablo Guerra not only noted the lack of a comics industry in Colombia, but also observed that whereas drawing like Jeffrey Brown in the United States might be some kind of act of irreverence, if you did that in Colombia, it, this was just foolish. Um, it's just a sim es simplemente imitar a Jeffrey Brown para anclarse en una realización demasiado fácil y simple. So Larava didn't, I think, attempt to lament national limitations, but rather turn its marginality, a magazine from Armenia publishing comics in a country far from having one of the most notable comic traditions, even in Latin America, into a gesture of border crossings. Such border crossings were not evident just in the inclusion of references to US comics. They were also present in the format of the magazine. Um, and it constantly used the physical format to reinvent itself. So it wasn't shy of creating connections to the digital realm, including links to social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, formspring.me, MySpace, if we remember those, um, or including the websites of contributing artists. The magazine, um, as I say, used its, its uh, format as a print edition to effect. As Daniel Jimenez Quiros, the editor, said in an interview with me, a printed comics magazine was valuable. The fact of having something printed on paper and being able to put that up against what other magazines meant in other parts of Colombia. It also started including musical playlists, the songs reflecting the magazine's outward looking vision with English language bands, Latin American performers, uh, both contemporary um, and more traditional and also other international performers that might fall under the banner of world music, if we can stomach such a term. Uh, and it would also start playing with the paper format by including a card strip folder around the cover from issue 12. So this was an opportunity for mini comics and jokes. Um, and uh, this one, I think, yes, this one includes the sort of the playful slogan, which I quite like, La Revolución Será de Dibujada. Uh, and Again, Kiros observed that the card strip was, this was a disaster in terms of distribution, he told me, because um, the barcode was on this particular thing and it constantly was getting ripped and falling off in bookshops and then they, they couldn't scan the thing. Um, but the idea was that it was sort of an attempt to echo magazines from other parts of the world, and in this particular case, the Spanish magazine Matador. And he also said, that the change in format for issue 17, which was the last one and came out after a three year gap, was supposed to echo the book like publications, um, magazines like Grant, uh, McSweeney's, and the Paris Review. Um, the list of contributors also, I think, highlights its international dimension. So after its first issues, and though contributors were always mainly Colombian, Larva always included a significant number of Latin American contributors. Between issues four and 17, the multinational variety was pretty clear as you can see in this grid. Um, so 122 Colombian contributions, 50 Argentine, 15 Spanish, 11 US, nine Peruvian, eight European, four Uruguayan, two Asian, two Cuban, one Bolivian, one Mexican, one Venezuelan, one Chilean, and yes, one Brazilian. Um, the magazine positioned itself as an outward looking national publication, one that engaged with a domestic, political and cultural situation, but which simultaneously asked its readers to situate Colombia within a wider network of conversation styles 
and dynamics. Um, it certainly was, I think, a political publication. It didn't shy away from addressing pressing issues like um, the, the price of the cocaine trade on Colombian society, um, about the idealization of the military within Colombian society, uh, and also the inclusion in first four issues of references to Article 20 of the Colombian Constitution, which ratified freedom of speech. Uh, and in fact, the magazine confronted its own issues with some kinds of, uh, of censorship because the Universidad de Quindío, which provided the funding for the early issues, was starting to feel uncomfortable with the magazine's content. Um, as Jimenez Quiroz said to me, they started to feel uncomfortable publishing this kind of strange drawings, naked people. I wouldn't say there was an attempt at censorship, but a kind of uh, an attempt at self-censorship. And that's when we decided to leave and publish independently. Um, and there are other examples of this, which I won't go into here, but, but so such political wrestlings underpinned the magazine's outlook. Its politics were certainly not, I think, aligned with any particular ideological position. Instead, the magazine referred to political violence, for example, in indirect and humorous ways, such as including a joke about postal bombs with the magazine's address, send your parcel bombs here. So its politics were less pamphlet, um, pamphleteering than humorous, understated and located in, as Apter would say, the fine grains of the publication. The gestures towards border crossings, towards a Latin American comic scene explicit and implicit was certainly part of that politics, as if the magazine was seeking out transnational networks of affiliations that move beyond any semblance of national populism. In some ways, then, I think this short comic by the Argentine artist Hernán Siriani maybe encapsulates some of the magazine's politics. In it, the protagonist sets fire to comics with the cries, basta de Batman, the hombre arañas, basta de línea clara, mente nazi, europea, and basta de artis, basta historieta sensible, basta ciencia ficción, etc., etc., and then expresses his desire for all kinds of excess and the impolitic, in which the words increasingly push the speaker to the edge of the frame. So the stream of words here in, celebrates excess, bodily fluids, pleasure, violence, the taboo, and the culture of the everyday. Though Larva was a magazine, such perspectives give it the traits of a fanzine and comics underground of the United States, as the reference here also to Gilbert Shelton makes clear. And the magazine would also make a similar point on its blog, praising Mineshaft for, quote, making clear its position in relation to what's called the establishment in the US a position that's not tamely contestatory, but a position of ideas and criticism, one rich in creative contributions. In some, a good definition of the concept of a fanzine as an alternative form of media. So in this presentation, I've highlighted how several print comics magazines were a dynamic space for exploring and moving beyond ideas of national comics traditions in Latin America in the first decade and a half or so of the 21st century. Whereas the Argentine Fierro may be burdened by history in its own past, makes little effort to escape its national framework, the other publications that you can see being published in Latin America play on their marginality to build transnational networks. I think these publications were transgressive more often than not in uh, the unexceptional sense of politics. Um, which Emily Apter says is characterized by gestures of refusal, non-cooperation, even civil disobedience. Um, I haven't really had any time here to discuss scenes, but I want to end by noting that the magazine landscape I've described should I think be seen in conjunction with zines that proceeded, ran parallel to and intersected with these publications. These zines I don't think were just um, uh, underground, but also in between, if you like, a further example of the palimpsestic crossroads of the comics world. Zines like these magazines I've discussed also embrace the tactile materialities of print cultures as a way of offering alternatives to both the digital worlds that were embedding themselves within contemporary Latin American culture, not least comics, and to the more formal print cultures of publishing houses. By exploring punks refashioning and celebration of waste, whether discarded materials of consumer society or stinking piles of human shit, zines would riff off the boundaries of these magazines, adding another impolitical voice to contemporary Latin American comics. <laughs>
Thanks. Thank you very much, James, for this really rich presentation. I think that was really good to have this contextualization of Latin America, what's really Latin America, what can be called Latin American and uh, the comics being situated between regionalism, nationalism, transnationalism, internationalism. Um, yeah, and also also the media, the in betweenness between zine magazine, the internet, and the, the interplay of these uh, different media. That was really interesting. Are there any questions uh, about the talk? You can raise your hand, use the chat uh, function. Peter. Wow, thank you so much, James. That was really inspiring your talk. And also to see some of the materials I have not been familiar with actually. And I was wondering, I mean, I really like your uh, focus on not only the transnational, but also on the transgressive. I think that became evident starting also with some more like sexist and also let's say from the iconographical standpoint, more generic or more, let's say more conventional um, um, takes. Um, to more, as, as I said, transgressive ones maybe. And I was wondering how much there is a sort of tradition within Latin America. I mean, I'm thinking about, of course, Alejandro Khodorovsky, for example, who would be one of the forerunners, I think, because in the 60s, in the late 60s, he was doing his his comics, right? Uh, and it's very interesting because it was published in Heraldo de Mexico, which was actually uh, a, um, a journal that had quite a big um, a distribution within Mexico. And of course, being a Chilean, um, there is this, this transnational dimension. And then also, I mean, they're really kind of uh, anarchic and surrealist and, and really, I mean, just like basically, um, attacking everything that's related to the bourgeoisie uh, and some of also the more established, even leftist nationalist positions he was attacking. So I was wondering, and he's kind of a proto-punk in a way in his comics, I think. And I was wondering if there is any kind of, I mean, I'm not, I'm not an expert in comics, but that would be one position I do know, and that seems at least from what I know, seems to be something very transgressive and one of the maybe more early takes. And I was wondering if there are connections to Khodorovsky or to other um, kind of transgressive earlier comic artists. So that would be my question. Uh, I mean, you're gonna, that, that's testing me on an area that I'm less familiar with. So once you take me back before the kind of like, uh, 80s I'm much less kind of confident so I couldn't say in that sense what I would say is first of all is to sort of consider what constitutes transgressive right and what constitutes transgressive changes over time of course so one of the interesting things maybe to think about with Fierro for example is that actually in terms of sexuality it was pretty transgressive in the 80s because obviously all the stuff about sort of naked women being on covers was also a kind of response to a, a sort of a hyper moralistic military dictatorship that had kind of cracked down on all of those kinds of things and which required you know people to wear you know to have short hair or, or, or sort of demanded that in some shape or form or, or school children to wear dresses of certain lengths and so obviously in that in a sense was transgressive but now looking back it seems kind of incredibly dated um i think the the transgressive nature does come out in, in in terms of these contemporary publications i think it does come out in the magazines but certainly the stuff i haven't talked about today the zines which i have sort of been working on a bit over the past six months there it's much more transgressive and it's pretty radical and comes out much more of that zine tradition of the 80s the punk scene um and yeah i i, I would recommend um What's his name? Um, Shane Green has written a really good book on uh, punk in uh, Peru. Uh, 
uh, I think he calls it seven punk reinterpretations of Peruvian reality, obviously playing on the Miriati thing. And it, it, he gives some good examples of some quite kind of anarchic uh, stuff, not so much on comics, but he's done stuff uh, working with artists there, also creating sort of sort of zines and stuff like that. So yeah, that's not a great answer to your question, partly because I don't know, but, um, but there you go, I riffed off it. Oh, thank you so much. I actually was a, a great answer because also, I mean, the point of what's being transgressive, actually, I didn't really contextualize so much in the historical background and you're completely right. And yeah, it's, as I said, fascinating presentation. Thank you, James. Anna, I think you're the next question. Yeah, so thank you uh, very much for this very interesting uh insight uh, in the South American comics. And I have uh, uh, two questions. So one is that I, um, uh, so while, while looking at Fierro, I was thinking also at, uh, I think it was Italian uh, underground comics, 70s uh, magazine, which is called uh, Frigidaire, which is, was, was very famous and also a little bit of this, uh, um, yeah, sexistic um, view of the word. And um, so I, I'm not, um, I don't know much about Argentina, but I know that uh, I'm, um, I'm Italian and I'm stroke, of, I'm, I'm always very surprised about the parallel or uh, mixtures or things that I know from Italy finding them in Argentina. And maybe I was wondering if this is also the case in, uh, uh, in these comics. And the second question that I have is that if, if something, uh, did something happen in the middle of the 2010s that all these magazines stopped in a way? So between the, you gave us at the beginning an overview about uh, um, uh, ending the last issues, right? And, and most of them were around 2015, 2017. So it was, did something happen? And uh, do you know if uh, the reductions or the artists that uh, would the reductions are still working in a way or if new projects began did they go through did they start writing longer comics because uh, I know from other parts of the world where they have comic magazines and they begin and they do but then the idea is always to get to graphic novels in a way to have enough time enough resources also to do this kind of things so thank you so much Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, the the answer to your first question is, uh, I mean, Argentine artists do have sort of quite long standing connections to artists in Europe, uh, particularly, I think, France and Italy. Um, so, I mean, the, the famous example is, um, is um, Hugo Pratt, for example. Yeah, yes. I mean, be part of, I think there they were inviting artists to come and work. That was during the sort of boom. So I think there is that established connection that's already there from the mid 20th century and um you know fierro i think also partly I, from what i recall was also sort of inspired by some science fiction french science fiction magazines is it metal land i think um so there are those kinds of connections so certainly um that that's kind of clear and i and i think you know like a lot of or it seems it seems to me that a, a lot of these publications, as I suggested about Ladaba, are also sort of constantly thinking about their position within a kind of global network of these kinds of publications and what are they kind of responding to or how are they how are they what kind of inspiration are they taking from different publications, but also at the same time, how can they mark themselves out as being different in some way from those publications? So it's a kind of complex mix of of, of converse, a sort of intellectual dialogue, if you like, in their head. Um, as to your second question about the end of publications, I mean, I, I, I tried to sort of, when I tried, when I was interviewing people, I sort of tried to pin this down and nobody seemed to sort of say it as such, but it does seem clear that the rise of the internet did have an impact here. Um, so it, it wasn't that they said, you know, well, there was no point, we weren't selling things, but I got the impression that did have an impact. Um, and it, you know, if, if you're faced with a set of, platforms where people can do things by themselves and they can manage their own creativity it is a lot easier to do it online and let's be honest and it's less expensive um and 
yeah, so I, I think that definitely had an impact. But I wouldn't say the thing, I wouldn't say the networks have disappeared. On the contrary, I mean, if anything, the networks have kind of exploded via all these different internet platforms. And there are still um, exhibitions that take place and then, you know, print publications that come, anthologies that come off the back of those exhibitions and things like that. So I wouldn't say that that means that those are dropped off. I mean, it is a good question because I never really got anybody to sort of concretely say, we stopped doing it because it was just economically made no sense with all these internet platforms that go on. No one, no one was kind of ex as explicit as that. Um, and Fiedra is still, still going on, I think. So, um, but, you know, it takes a lot. It, one thing I, I, I was, kind of clear about is it takes an awful lot of energy to, to put these things together because they're constantly looking for sources of funding. You know, how can they sustain it? Economies are all over the place. You know, I can imagine at the moment that's even more complicated um, uh, in, in terms of sort of producing print publications as well. What, what was the distribution like at the moment with lockdowns and things like that? I mean, that must be a nightmare. Uh, we have a comment in the chat on the political situation that this might have an influence as well on the uh, Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah, I mean, certainly the the impact of the Macri administration on uh, cultural production in general was massive. So certainly that would be the case. And, um, you know, I mean, e even even basic things like paper is really expensive um to to import because it's all imported it's very expensive so i mean actually producing the thing is very cost worthy are there any other questions um, i do have a question but it's not urgent so <laughs> if there are any others i would give you um yeah peter mine is actually not urgent either so if you want to go first um i was Oh, actually, I was just going to take up something you mentioned. Um, so did like, is there a shift towards, I mean, you've been talking about online comics as well. Are, are you looking into this in, in your research project or um, is that not really, I mean, it would be very complex as it is, even looking at the early 2000s, then I mean, the project is probably something you could research on with a huge group. Um, because yeah. of the complexity and all, but um, are, are you at least kind of looking into it a little bit? I would be very interested. Yeah, well, originally when I first envisaged putting it, writing a book on this period, I, I thought, no, I'm just going to do things on print stuff. You know, this is just kind of, that's the way I'm going to go. I had no real rationale for doing that. It was just what I liked, right? I like books. Um, and then I sort of realized actually I couldn't do that. It was just wasn't going to work because there were so many kind of interactions and crossovers. So I'm, I'm not I'm not sort of necessarily particularly interested in digital comics in and of themselves, but I'm interested in, in, in them as part of this landscape, if you like. So yeah, I just I will discuss them at certain points. I haven't done loads of things on that, but I have sort of looked at certain websites, certain blogs, and the platforms of certain artists and the way that they use the kind of online stuff. But the bits I mean, for example, I mean, I guess one could look at say chicks on comics and if you know, if I got a chapter that's looking at uh, you know, women's production of comics in this period. And in that chapter, I look at Clitoris, the, the, one of the magazines I referenced in the presentation, but I, you know, didn't discuss here. But there I would certainly look at that kind of platform and think about how it relates to those publications. So, yes, but not like exclusively. It's not like I'd have a, I, I wouldn't, I was thinking about this. I don't think I'd have a chapter that was like digital comics. I wouldn't sort of fit in the way I was conceiving what I'm doing, if that makes sense. Uh, well, I have a question um, on comics beyond the page to use the title of your book, actually, but on the situation of festivals, because you mentioned it briefly in your talk, and um, I was remembering the situation in Brazil. There is a huge comic festival called Fiki, uh, and um, the underground artists or the more regional, more smaller artists, which are not distributed by a huge editor, they, they are never invited, so they came up with a second event called Fiki Fora, so stay stay outside, like this, this pun. And yeah, what, how's the situation in the Spanish-speaking Latin American countries? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's sort of interesting things going on there too, right? I mean, so, for example, I, um, 
I, I in the previous project, one of the partners was Entre Vignetas, and that was sort of partly or, or the editor of Larava was Daniel Daniel Jimenez Quiroz, who I referred to. He was sort of involved in that, so I I got to know them a little bit, and was looking at sort of the history of the festival a little bit, um, but sort of simultaneous to Entre Vignetas, they also started this kind of like almost like underground festival called Anti Vignetas that would run sort of parallel to the main event. And then they would hold these kind of underground events, uh, sort of zine things, even like performance stuff. You can find some really odd videos on YouTube of, of, um, of sort of like, they're, they're almost like happenings, I suppose, um, taking place in public squares in Colombia. was. And so there was this kind of, yeah, but I don't necessarily see them as, um, I mean, they're partly about contesting the sort of the establishment of the comics festivals. And certainly um, one thing that seems to have happened in Colombia, at least from talking to people there, appears to be the fact that there is this kind of massive success there now. You know, unlike in Argentina, it doesn't have that. So it does have a, a long history of comics production, but not, not nowhere near the same scale. And suddenly there's this boom and suddenly there are, there's much more infighting in the world of comics there you know, tensions between publishing houses, editors, artists, festivals, who's being invited where, who's getting paid to do what. Um, so suddenly it's a much more kind of like antagonistic field, I think, than it was before, simply because before it wasn't that big. Um, so you do see these kind of like festivals and then anti-festivals or, um, and, and, and also zines there is really important, right? These kind of like zine events, which are much more small scale, um, but, really important in terms of sort of comics production and, and sort of exchanges of ideas and meeting people and networks and stuff like that. Thank you. Uh, there is another question from Leah. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi, James. Very pleased to see you here and thank for your brilliant talk. Um, I um, wanted to remark that um, El Volcan uh, anthology you mentioned at the beginning of your speech um, includes also Brazilian works and um, uh, Carboncito also I think um, had this uh, range of, of, of including also Portuguese um, uh, speaking or well in Brazilian uh, production of comics and I'm sure that in, in um, yeah, otherwise in Brazil there exist uh, publications who also include a Spanish speaking Latin American comic production. So do you consider these as well or, or what's what about that? Um, I mean consider them in, in so far as they're part of the landscape but in a way that would be a question that I would ask people here. I mean my impression is that if uh, Put it this way. So the, the project that's going to start on the 1st of March, right, we decided we were going to focus on uh, Colombia, Peru and Argentina. It's my impression that these three countries seem to be the kind of driving forces of and maybe Chile too, right, uh, of, of sort of Spanish speaking Latin American comics networks. I don't know. I'm putting it out there. I don't know if that's true. I haven't really thought about it very much, but that's my impression. Um, and even Mexico doesn't seem all that connected. Um, and Brazil, it kind of like seems to be, but only as a sort of like a, a sort of figure on the margins in a way. Like there are some exchanges and certainly there are some collaborations and things, but it doesn't seem to be all that significant. I might be wrong. That's my impression. Um, so it's not that I would certainly ignore Brazil. But I mean, my Portuguese is not good. So that that's a further limitation. But I mean, that's not a good academic reason, reason for not doing it. It's just that my impression is that it doesn't, they don't seem to be at the kind of heart of it. So yeah, they're in, 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 in there are artists, including El Volcan, and yes, there are contributions and they are invited, but it doesn't seem to be a sort of a massive thing. It's, it seems much more important, the kind of connections that go from Colombia down through Peru, uh, to a certain extent, Bolivia, I think, uh, Chile and Argentina. That's my impression. And Uruguay. Are there any other questions or comments? Oh, yeah, Peter. Sorry for having so many questions. <laughs> it's just very inspiring talk you gave. And 
I'm, I'm wondering, and we've been talking about, about this earlier, about transmedia dimensions. I mean, I think a lot of these artists probably work in other art forms, maybe. I mean, storyboarding, for example, also thinking about economic necessities, maybe, but also about kind of synergies, artistic synergies, and also, I mean, the rootedness, for example, in punk culture. You've been kind of commenting on that, right? And then the playlist included the Sex Pistols, which I very much liked, so that was good to see. And, um, and also all the Zion culture, of course, is rooted in a kind of subculture, so to say, that was very much intermedia um, or transmediatic, as you want, however you want to call it. So if you could maybe comment a little bit on that, or I'm not sure if you've, if you've looked into that, but um, that... What? Yeah, no, I mean, I don't, I, I think it'd be fair to say that nobody's making a living out of comics in Latin America. Um, I mean, the artists generally, from my, what I understand, and I don't know, Amadeo may know better than me, but um, Fierro may be the only publication that was paying artists. And I don't even know that it was paying that much or if it was paying them anything. But um, if it was paying them, I guess it wasn't a huge amount. I, when I spoke to Daniel in terms of Larava, he said that artists never got paid for any contribution, although they did for the final issue, but then it never came out. So that's a, the nice irony. Um, but, you know, in general, artists are not getting paid anything. So they, they're all having, they're all living off something else. Um, you know, and I think a lot of them are, are, are teaching classes like um you know teaching comics classes but i doubt they're earning huge amounts from that um probably yeah in the publishing world's graphic design yeah there there, there is that um and one thing that i felt when i was talking to a few people a couple of years ago entre nietas was that there was actually very little knowledge about the financial aspect of working as a working in the field of comics right i mean they didn't seem to know what publishing houses might pay them for certain books in different countries or how that played out. There's a lot of secrecy and in a way, like a lot of secrecy around the whole idea of pay anyway, in the contemporary world, like nobody asks what people are being paid or, um, you know, you know, that's something you just don't discuss, but that can be a big problem if you're in a, in a sort of underpaid and very ephemeral kind of world. Um, so I was at some point sort of toyed with the idea of, doing more research into that it's not something I know huge amounts about but yeah comics then becomes this kind of um sort of uh well I don't know maybe, maybe because there isn't so much money around it I suppose then there there is that notion of um critique that comes with it and the under and and the sort of the transgressive um so I'd say those things probably go hand in hand certainly in in the case of zines, right, which is all about DIY and not, you know, photocopying, cutting the costs down and, and distributing things for free or for very little money. Um, and, and that in and of itself becomes important as a sort of a counter capitalist kind of movement and exercise in and of itself. Uh, okay, I'm aunts, yeah. Yeah, right. I mean, there was yeah, paid artists, but usually a really low figure, which sparked frequent complaints. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, yes. It, yeah. And it was one of the few publications that published paid artists in Argentina, <clears throat> at least comics publications. I know that several uh, editorials, publishing houses, small publishing houses here in Argentina have pay artists when they sign a contract and they have some sort of royalty scheme, uh, like Hotel de las Ideas or. Um, Matan el mensajero, but I don't know uh, which figures they they handle, the, which are the numbers that they have. Uh, and as I was saying in the chat, uh, I know a lot of artists from Argentina who make their living primarily through illustration for magazines or or whatever um, animation, especially storyboard storyboards. Oh, okay, great. Uh, there was one question in the chat regarding the French comic scene. Um, I think it's about a comparison. I'm not sure. Um, French has a very active comic culture up till now. Um, what about your view on that? So I don't know if, if this is, I mean, I don't know zilch about uh, French comics. 
um, other than obviously Hergé and one really nice kind of like um, comic that I have that doesn't have any words in it, which happens to end up in Cuba. So I don't know, it was kind of cool. Anyway, uh, so I can't really say anything about that. What I can say is that there are some collaborations between Argentina and France and different shapes. Well, I went to uh, one sort of exhibit at the, I think it was the Alliance Francaise in Buenos Aires that had a small exhibit where they were, they put several kind of uh, women Argentine artists in collaboration with several women French comics um, artists and they created a little exhibition there. It wasn't very big, but I thought it was a sort of a symbolic of that, that connection. And um, this guy, Thomas La Sanz in Argentina, at least created some of these kinds of connections, or, I mean, through uh, art artists and some of those publications that I referred to that he edited did have French contributors as well. And, um, you know, certainly I think some of the bigger events, the sort of comics events and exhibits in France. There's, there's one in, uh, isn't it, did I see that on that on the list? Was it in Poitiers, I think. You know, there's sort of an interest in sustaining those kinds of connections to the other way around too as well. But that's not my area of expertise, I have to say. So others may have other examples. Are there further questions? Uh, okay, <laughs> Peter. I was wondering about your research project. Um, are you doing that on your own or is it a cooperation? And do you actually, I mean, you've been talking about interviews you've done with some of the comic artists. Is that going to kind of flow into your research project? Is that going to be a source or could you maybe tell us a little bit about your research project? I'm really interested in that. Sure. So, um, so maybe uh, I think it's probably slightly confusing in a sense. There's probably two things going on simultaneously. So, I was uh, I ran a an international network a few years ago, um, which is about sort of it was called Comics in the Latin American City. I did some research in that that I had some ideas for writing a book about Latin American comics over the past couple of decades. So I'm writing that book now. This would be the presentation I gave today, if you like, would be a chapter from that. And it's gonna cover other things. There's a chapter on punk and zines. Um, and there's, um, th there'll be a chapter probably, I don't know, I'm thinking probably I ought to do something on infection in Latin American comics, seems like quite topical. Um, where I'm probably going to talk about zombies and vampires and things. Uh, there'll be a chapter on that. There'll be a chapter on probably urban encounters. So it's, it's a book that's kind of quite broad in scope. Um, and so I undertook, well, I mean, I did a couple of interviews just to sort of feed into some specific issues. I've spoken to a few different people. I've got a few more things lined up. So that's something that I'm doing by myself now. And the idea is that, I, you know, at some point, goodness knows when I'll actually finish this thing and you know that that would be a, a monograph but then at the same time I applied for this grant with Pete Wade to do something on comics and race in Latin America that's the project that starts on the 1st of March and so that will take us down a slightly different route and that's much more collaborative in the sense of I'm working with him but there are these two postdoctoral positions so there'll be a core team of four and then the idea is that we work with um certainly like six artists. So we're gonna kind of, um, I mean, we, we, we factor into the budgets a small amount of pay to pay them to produce some comics on this particular topic. So a couple of artists from Argentina, a couple from Peru, a couple from Colombia, and then we'll do a kind of a historical research into the depiction of race in Latin American comics in those countries um, over the course of the 20th century and 21st century. So there'll be that kind of historical dimension to the project. And then there'll be a much more kind of like contemporary one working with the artists. Um, that's why we have is a, is a collaboration with Pete Wade who's in social anthropology and one of the postdocs will be social anthropology. So they'll do, that person will work a lot more with the artists and kind of talk to them about what the impact of race is on the profession, not just their work, but also the profession and how they feel about that um, as an issue. So that that's gonna last for sort of three years. Um, and yeah, I'm feeling totally un un unprepared for that, to be honest. But, but anyway, that, that's coming up next. That sounds great. Fascinating project. All right. Okay. 
Actually, I wanted to ask you to talk a bit about the book Comics Beyond the Page, but I guess everybody can read it, so <laughs> that's not well, yeah. It's a free. It's a free download as well. Yeah, so. exactly, and and it might be interesting because we already talked about um, yeah, mural pictures in the in the series of of um, lectures uh, when we talked about Mozambique, for example. And I think your book might be a good um, yeah a good source to further go into that. Um, that's, that's the free download. You can get the whole thing. Great, that's perfect. I will send it as well via email. And as we are running out of time, so maybe if there is no last question, we can also call it a day. Ceci, there is the last question. <laughs> uh, Jane, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm really not very familiar so much with, uh, with this issue, but uh, listening and uh, um, actually listening to the answer, the, the last answer that you gave, um, I don't know why, but I have the impression that all the comic culture is very urban. And you were saying like cities. There are some, uh, did you find some examples? And also because I was uh, very interested in what you say about the regional perspective that uh, you wouldn't say that there is an Latin American aesthetic. And have you ever found um, examples that they are more connected with the native indigenous roots or projects that they escape a little bit of this urban culture aesthetic? Yeah, that's that's a great question, actually, um, because I think the idea is that, or is often suggested that all these comics are very urban, and I, I said that myself, but actually there are lots of good examples of um, of works that aren't necessarily that focused on, on the urban stuff. So I really love and have written a bit about in the book, I tried to write about, a comic by the Colombian Inu Waters called Emohan, which is a sort of a Colombian myth about this really hairy character who lives in the Rio Magdalena and sort of um, kidnaps virgins from the side of the river and stuff. Anyway, it's, it's sort of fun. It's, it's worth seeking out. It's a really great comic. Um, so that's one. But there's a lot of, um, and, and this actually probably would, would, would be another part of the book, is a lot of um, comics that might fall under the banner of sort of social process comics, I think. And a lot of those take up environmental issues. So, you know, Jesus Cosio, La Guerra del Agua is a great Peruvian one. That's that's online. Um, you, can, you can look at that. Um, and there's a lot of uh, Caminos Condenados. There's another Colombian one which looks at conflicts over water with major kind of corporate companies. Um, and there's a quite a lot of things about thing, you know, comics about displacement in Colombia and things like that. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of examples actually of stuff that's not particularly urban. In terms of work that's produced specifically by indigenous artists, that I'm less kind of less sure about. But I would hope that we can seek some of that out on the project because actually, I mean, I, I'm sort of aware of. I mean, what, what, depends, I suppose, on what you define as indigenous, but um, um, but certainly aware that there are kind of art, black artists and artists with uh, Indian heritage who are drawing comics. Um, so that's something that certainly we'd tease out in, in the project, hopefully. Jasmine's just sent a link. Yeah, right. Um, Jasmine just sent a link to a book about graphic indigenity, comics in the Americas and Australasia. That sounds great regarding the topic. So thank you very much once again, James, for that talk and the discussion and your availability. And thanks to all of you for the questions and for being here. Uh, and we will meet again next week with Lea Hübner, a talk about translating comics. That will, uh, that will be in German. So just to let you know, the conversation with Lea will be in German then. So yeah, have a thank nice day. Much. And thank you, James. Thank you so much, James. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye.